what was the straw or what were the straws that broke the camel's back with respect to alcohol and seeking help? Well, there were a couple important inflection points. Um, one of which was getting two DUIs essentially in a row with ridiculously high blood alcohol contents, um, looking at jail time, my boss finding out at the law firm and, and being on the precipice of, of getting fired. Uh, that's a whole rabbit hole, you know, sort of chaotic disaster that I weathered. Another one would, was uh, a marriage, or I should say like a wedding that went awry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I got married and that, that uh, relationship ended on the honeymoon, which is a whole crazy story. <laughs> story. That is inextricably linked to, I mean, I was sober at the time, but it's very much linked to, you know, my alcoholism. So there's big events like that. But I, I think, you know, those situations created such a deep level of shame inside of me that I wasn't able to shake alcohol in the wake of those experiences because I didn't have the emotional tools to process them. So I continued to drink for a while. I mean, the, the, the wedding was really, you know, the nadir of the whole thing. And a, a reasonable person would have woken up and gotten sober at that time. But I needed to medicate myself through that emotional shitstorm until one day, you know, I, I basically woke up and it, it was I was hung over. But it wasn't like I had, you know, I reaped any kind of chaos the night before. But it's just that moment of realizing, like, I've had enough. Like, I can't live this way anymore. It's, it, it's just so lonely and desperate, and it only leads in one direction. And I think, you know, that's what it takes. Like, for anybody who has experience with addiction, particularly substance addiction, you have this sense, like you asked me earlier on, Tim, like, when did I know I had a problem? Like, I knew I had a problem very early on in my drinking career. But that's very different from the willingness to do anything about it. Like I harbored this notion that this was a problem for me, but you're also protecting it because you want to be able to keep doing it. And that's what that's what leads to, you know, this sort of double life where you're hiding your behavior from other people and deluding yourself into thinking that they don't know what's going on. But ultimately you realize like everybody knows what's going on. And on some level, it's a process of like stripping away those, those layers of denial until you can really, you know, face the objective truth of what you're doing. And that's a very terrifying thing. And, and so that's kind of what was going on inside of me until, you know, this day in 1998, where I was like, okay, I've had it. Like, I'm, I'm ready to really take this seriously and do something about it. How old were you roughly then? My math is, is going to fail me at this moment, but 1998, yeah, I was 31. 31. All right. And because it struck me as a curveball, if you don't want to get into it, that's totally fine. But in my mind, I envisioned this honeymoon just going down as a fireball due to some catastrophe that was alcohol induced, but you said you were sober. Yeah. Uh, are you willing to expand on that at all? And if not, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no. It's so hard to describe this and have it make sense. But essentially what happened was I had been drinking quite a bit. I got engaged to this woman. I was living in San Francisco at the time. She was living in Palo Alto and is from Palo Alto. But in the uh, kind of lead up to this wedding, because we had gotten engaged, I had taken a job in Los Angeles. So we were living in separate cities. And I think during that interim period when she got distance between me, she realized like, maybe this isn't the guy I want to marry. And I had come clean with her about the DUIs. And I think that was very scary to her. So even though I had been sober for a number of months and, and told her that I was committed to this path of sobriety, I think, you know, in her heart of hearts, she really wanted to get out of this relationship, but she was unable to muster the strength to break it off herself. And I think that she wanted me to break it off. And so there was so much energy behind this impending wedding that was happening that it just kind of transpired without anybody hitting the brakes. And I was trying to be conciliatory and say, because I knew she was off and not present and something was wrong. And I would say, are you okay? Like, what's going on? How can I make you feel comfortable with all of this? And it's a much longer story. I go into detail about it in my book, but essentially, you know, she, she permitted the wedding to go through, but then then didn't want to sign the marriage certificate. 
that's a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Cause for pause. And, yeah. And, you know, the night of the wedding, when we went back to the honeymoon suite, that did not go well. I'm surprised that we even went on the honeymoon. But I think in my mind, I was thinking I'm going to try to make this right and it's all going to work out. Like that was its own level of delusion. And while we were on this honeymoon in a, on a Caribbean island, it was clear that this relationship had had no future. And ultimately, we were able to have a conversation about it. And she ended up leaving early. And at that moment, I was left with myself with no tools and having been sober for six months, but unable to really process the, the emotional devastation of having, you know, just basically had everybody that I cared about in the world with like 12 groomsmen in this wed- wedding in Palo Alto, you know, bear witness to a marriage that clearly wasn't going to, uh, you know, work out. And it was really devastating to me. So um, I ended up getting drunk on that island and really struggled to uh, get sober again for quite some time after that. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, 1998, 31, I've had enough. How do you seek help or what do you, what are your next actions after that? So prior to that, I had been court ordered to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I had been to meetings, but I wasn't doing it because I wanted to get sober. I was doing it because I was compelled to do it. And I think that's an important distinction, um, especially for people who, who are struggling or have people in their lives that are struggling with a substance issue. You want to help them. You want to intervene and you can create you know, interventions and things like that to get people into treatment. But ultimately, if that person is resistant to it or isn't interested in getting sober, that's going to be a very tough hill to climb. So willingness is like crucial. Um, So when I was attending those AA meetings, I I, I lacked that level of, of willingness. It was more like, I just need to get people off my back so I can go back to living the way that I want to live. And why is everybody bugging me? But in the wake of that wedding experience, um, when my drinking got more and more dire, um, my parents had reached the level of their tolerance threshold with me. And basically, my dad said, listen, we love you, um, but we just can't continue to watch you destroy yourself like this. And we can't have anything to do with you. But if you're ready to get sober, we're, of course, here from you. But until then, um, you know, we're, we're just, we're not available to you. However, because they were so terrified of, of all of this, they had found an addiction medicine, um, psychiatrist in Los Angeles. And they said, we have this guy, you know, it might be great if you go and see him. So I started seeing this addiction medicine specialist and he knew, you know, he just rang my bell immediately and was like, here's the deal, dude, you're an alcoholic and you need to go to treatment until you do that. Like nothing's going to change and your life's going to continue to be terrible. And I would try to negotiate with him and say, well, I think I can do it in AA. So I was kind of in and out of AA doing my own self-experimentation with trying to get sober. But every time I would crawl back into his office and I was honest with him and I said, yeah, I relapsed again or this happened. Um, but at some point I made a deal with him because he was like, are you ready to go to treatment? I was like, let me try one more time. And he said, okay. And to his credit, like, I think that's a really interesting approach. Like you have to back off a little bit and allow people to have their process. It's like inception. Like they have to come into this awareness on their own. You cannot compel somebody to see themselves as, as they really are. And of course I relapsed crawled back into his office. And because I was considered myself such a man of my word, I said, well, I made a deal with you. So, okay, now I'll go to, I'll go to treatment. And that's, you know, I called him after this one bender and I said, I'm, I'm ready. And he got a bed for me. And I immediately go online and I'm researching treatment centers and I'm looking for the, like the spa resort one, you know, that, (laughs) that's in, that has really nice accommodations. He's like, no, 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 here's where you're going. This place in Oregon, I got a bed for you. Like, get on the plane today. And that's basically how it began. 